Questions about aromaticity? Questions about where we left off with uh, structuring aromatics? We got two heterocycles. Uh, any questions about anything? Question, Jason. Um, the product for our lab today it says our melting point IR and yield should only be attained after air drying for several days. Uh huh. So if we make it and dry it, then yeah. we're supposed to come in a few like, days later. And no, you uh, be next week. Yeah. Uh, no, the lab is designed to accomplish everything during uh, scheduled lab time. Uh, if there is some opportunity to come in, basically instead of saying it needs to dry a week, it doesn't need to dry a week. But oh, that's the language. I mean, uh, do not expect it to come in uh, beyond lab time. Typically, this product does need to dry longer than usual, and so that's why that's sort of there. Because you'll get a, a broad melting point, IR will show water, that type of stuff. Uh, other questions about the lab? No other questions? Okay. Uh, Let's look at, uh, if there's no questions about anything up here, let's look at uh, aromaticity of heterocycles. A heterocycle is a ring that's going to contain our heteroatom, that is a non-carbon, of course not hydrogen, because hydrogen can't make two bonds. Uh, classic examples, pyridine. We've seen pyridine, it's a, we use it as a base, it's a fairly weak base, because it's a neutral molecule. Um, I'll show you an orbital description over there, but let's kind of work our way towards it. I'm going to draw some stuff on the board, but I'm going to essentially draw that over there, okay? Um, it's a cyclic conjugated system. Does every atom have a p orbital? Cyclic conjugated. That's the first question. Okay? P orbital, p orbital, pi bond, p orbital, p orbital, pi bond, p orbital. P orbital make pi bond? Yeah. I mean, how do you make pi bonds? P orbital overlapping with P orbital. Must, the nitrogen must have a P orbital, yeah? It is cyclic conjugated. Okay? What's the hybridization of the nitrogen? First off, the nitrogen does have one lone pair, right? Nitrogen makes three bonds with one lone pair, unless it's very odd. What's the hybridization of the nitrogen? SP2. SP2. Uh huh. It says it over there, but it's SP2, yeah? Okay, if we graph that, sp2, how many hybrids does an sp2 have? Three hybrids, right? And what's left over? P orbital. Okay, what type of bonds do you see that nitrogen making? Sigma bond to carbon, sigma bond to carbon. I see two sigma bonds to carbons. Sigma bond to carbon, sigma bond to carbon. What other type of bond do you see that nitrogen making? Pi bond to carbon. And this is your double bond right there, right? Okay. What type what type of orbital is the lone pair in? I could have asked you that at the very beginning. LP in what type of orbital? <coughs> lone pairs in what type of orbital? SP2, right? There it is right here. It has to be. Boom. Lone pair. Hybrid SP2 orbital. I mean that, so that's your setup here. There's a P orbital there making pi bond. If we draw an orbital diagram, it would look like this. Every atom has a p orbital. Here's the nitrogen over here. The p orbital is there. It can line up with the rest, and you're going to have six all lined up. Uh, it's trigonal planar. Do you see the trigonal planar? Boom, boom, boom. There's the trigonal planar of the three hybrids. And in one of the hybrids, 
mean, this way you got a bond, this way you got a bond, this way you got what? Well, there. It's in a hybrid in the trigonal planar arrangement. <coughs> Shown right here. So, do you see that that nitrogen has one p orbital? It can interact with the other five. How many pi electrons total in the system? The pi system. Six. Somebody? Six. Six, yes. Six pi electrons. I mean, there's, there's one in every p orbital, right? I mean, there's the valence, there's the one in the nitrogen. Nitrogen, the five arrows of the five valence electrons of nitrogen. A uh, psychic conjugated system with six pi electrons, what is it? What type of compound is this? <coughs> aromatic, pyridine is aromatic. We just replaced the nitrogen with the CH of the benzene with an N. Any questions about this structure here? Structure pretty straightforward. Questions about the structure? Possible? So pyridine is an aromatic compound. Is the is the is the nitrogen alone here basic or not? Yes. Uh, it's going to be basic. A long pair and a hybrid is typically basic unless it's sp and then it gets to where it's not. sp and three nitrogen certainly basic. <coughs> uh, here's another question. Is that long pair involved in the aromaticity? No. No, it's not. It's available to go react with protons. Okay, pyridines, it's a weak base, but it's basic. In contrast, we'll see down here, parole is not basic. Let's look at parole. And these illustrate two types of nitrogens that you'll see in aromatic rings. Then we could go to other compounds and say, hey, this is a pyridine type nitrogen, or hey, this is a pyridine type nitrogen. Conjugated system. Yes. So I hear a yes and a no. Why do you say no? What's the hybridization of the nitrogen? Sideways. I'm going, to, I'm going to draw this, but I'm going to take you through it. Let me draw it, okay? I'm going to turn it sideways. Uh, there's a pi bond here and here, right? Okay, the pi bond is made up of one electron, one electron overlapping, and this pi bond is made up of one electron, one electron overlapping. There's your two pi bonds. Yes, there is overlap here as well. Okay. What? Are we close to getting an aromatic system here? Yes. What do we need to get an aromatic system? 
Huh. We need a p orbital here. <coughs> now, if it's sp3, there ain't no p orbital there. Right, Antonio? So it's sp3, he only has four hybrids and there are no p orbitals, right? So if it's sp3, there's no chance of it being the super stable. Let's instead say nitrogen, are you willing to become sp2? And if you're sp2, we're going to make you a trigonal planar, and there's the trigonal planar. <coughs> And what's left over? P orbital. And nitrogen, because, what's this nitrogen bonded to? H. Now because you have three bonds and there's nowhere else to put the lone pair, I'm going to put the lone pair in your P orbital. Will you go with me here, nitrogen? Okay. Now what do I have? I now have overlap all the way around. So is it a cyclic conjugated system? Check. How many pi electrons in this system? One, two, three, four. Six pi electrons. Right? What do we have here? Aromatic. Parole is aromatic. Okay, here's the setup. Trigonal planar. Do you want to graph it? It's sp2. Why would this one be sp2 and not our traditional sp3? We learned in Genkium that four regions is sp3. Why does this want to be sp2? So it can be aromatic. Okay, there's always exceptions to the norm. Okay. sp2 means what? Trigonal planar. There's a trigonal planar with a p orbital left over. If we want to graph that, sp2 means three hybrids and a p left over. What type of bonds do you see this nitrogen making? Sigma bond to carbon, sigma bond to carbon, and what? Sigma bond to H. Where must the lone pair be? Lone pair is in a P orbital. That's two electrons. Two, three, four, five, six. <coughs> the system has six pi electrons. It's cyclic conjugated. The role is an aromatic carbon. Huge difference, though. Up there, the lone pair was in what type of orbital? SP2. Up there, it was in SP2. Down here, the lone pair is in what type of orbital? I just, yeah. <coughs> LP in P orbital, not basic. Lone pairs in P orbitals are typically not basic. They're busy doing resonance. They're not interested in protons. They're busy doing resonance and being cyclic conjugated and being in these MOs that are spread out all over, all over the molecule. Two different types of nitrogens that you'll see in your heteroaromatic compounds. How does it look? Can you see the difference? Okay. 75, 80% of this is just structured from organic one. But we're just kind of seeing it put together in terms of cyclic conjugated and six pi electrons. Um, histidine. Histidine is an amino acid. If you take biochem, you'll learn all your amino acids. You'll also learn that some amino acids are basic, some are acidic, some are neutral. Histidine is a basic amino acid. It contains the ring system imidazole. If you put another nitrogen in parole at the 1 3 position, that's called imidazole. We can, we can have nitrogens at all positions and still be aromatic. Imidazole is here. Sometimes the rings are drawn with squared off sides, sometimes they're not, but that's imidazole. And the whole thing is histidine. Uh, question. Which, ad, which nitrogen of histidine is the basic nitrogen? Uh, I mean, that's a pyridine type nitrogen. It's the same bonding arrangement as pyridine. That's a parole type nitrogen, the same as parole. This lone pair is involved in the aromaticity to make 2, 4, 6 pi electrons. That lone pair is not. It's sitting out there in a hybrid, able to react with protons. Uh, 
Anybody heard of uh, anybody ever heard of Valium, Ativan, Xanax? What about Merced? Yeah. What does Merced look like? What are these types of compounds? Somebody. All those compounds are what type of drug class? Benzodiazepines, yes. Here's a benzodiazepine here, uh, Versed. Uh, I was given this yesterday when I had a procedure done at the hospital. Uh, and then they <coughs> gave me something else to really make me happy. <laughs> um, but this is Versed. What's the name of the ring that's up there in the corner? It's fused to the rest of the molecule, but what, what's the name of that ring up there? It's an imidazole ring up there in the top right quadrant. Which, which nitrogen up there is the most basic? Yeah, it's a pyridine type nitrogen, okay? Question, is this nitrogen basic or not? There's a long pair there. When you see nitrogens in rings, they're either pyridine type or parole type. Is that a pyridine or a parole type? That's a pyridine type. This long pair is in what type of orbit? Sp2. Okay? It's got two basic nitrogens. The nitrogen in the middle is not basic. It's, it's, it's part of the aromaticity. Other than nitrogen down at the very bottom. What if we uh, take the five member vein and stick an oxygen in here? How many little pairs on this guy? Two. Two. Two there. Aromatic? Anti aromatic? Non aromatic? Uh, let's turn it sideways and draw a, let's see, pi bond, one electron, one electron makes pi bond, one electron, one electron makes pi bond, there's overlap there of course. Are we close to being aromatic? Yeah. Or let's first say this, are we close to being cyclic conjugated? Yeah. What do we need to be cyclic conjugated? The yeah. orbital. How many electrons do we need in that orbital to be, have a fully cyclic conjugated system with four and plus two electrons? Two. two. Now it's fully cyclic conjugated, and how many pi electrons? Two, three, four, five, six. So what are we saying the hybridization of this oxygen is? What else is on this oxygen, by the way? Another long pair. So, what hybridization do you want to say for this? Is it sp3? Yeah. Apparently not, because sp3 doesn't have a p orbital. If it was sp3, we wouldn't be showing a p orbital. Okay? How about sp2? Let's graph sp2. One, two, three, boom. What type of bonds do you see this oxygen making? Sigma bond to carbon, sigma bond to carbon. How many long pairs? Two. Two. Where are they at? One's in a P and one's in a hybrid. There's the one in the P. What is the geometry of these three hybrids? We're going to plane them. Okay. If one is going this way and this way, how's the other orbital projected? This way. I mean, if I do trickle a planar, wouldn't I do that? Does that look trickle a planar? Yeah. And all these are orbitals, right? These are these are your sigma orbitals, right? But what's in this orbital here? Lone pair. One lone pair is in a p orbital. One lone pair is in a hybrid in the trickle planar arrangement with the other two orbitals that are making bonds. Pyrrhine is indeed aromatic. How do we know? 
somebody tell me how we, how we would figure out. How do we know? NMR? Yeah. Doing NMR. What, what else? Heats of hydrogenation? Mm -hmm. Well, a number of things we went over. Uh, what about thiophene? What's the difference between oxygen and sulfur? Sulfur is bigger. Other than that, is there any difference? Got the same number of valence electrons. Thiophene, you just put an S there and it's the same thing. Except it's bigger. Instead of dealing with what, what shell is this uh, for oxygen? This is the two. Second shell. For sulfur, you're dealing with the third shell. Orbitals are bigger. Show it bigger. Um, sulfur is the same exact setup. Diaphane. We could get into something here. Both of these are aromatic. One of them is more aromatic than the other. Furan, although it's aromatic, is not highly aromatic. That means if you do an MR, the peaks aren't shifted to the NMR region quite as much as thiophene. And actually, if you react furan with bromine, it actually reacts by addition rather than substitution. So it exhibits some non-aromatic properties, but it also exhibits some aromatic ones. Somebody give me a gander of why it's less aromatic than, say, thiophene. Because the oxygen is more electronegative? Yes. <clears throat> Here, to be fully conjugated, the oxygen has to allow its electrons to be fully engulfed in the pi system. But oxygen is a little bit greedy. Okay? It doesn't like to share off with all these other orbitals. Because of that, furan is known to be not that aromatic. Where thiophene, sulfur doesn't mind sharing its electrons, and we can show resonance structures by maybe here and here. And so you start moving these electrons around the ring with such a resonance structure. If I see that, when you start moving the electrons around the ring, the sulfur takes on a positive charge as it lets its electrons go away. Same thing for oxygen. But sulfur doesn't mind a positive charge as much. Oxygen doesn't like it. It's like, hold on, I'm just, <laughs> just hold on. Okay. By the way, the biggest producer of furan in the United States is General Mills. They also make your morning cereal. What they do is they take the leftover corn, and then go into the cereal, and they digest it down to a five carbon sugar, and the five carbon sugar can be converted to this, there's five carbons, but then they can remove that aldehyde group. They sell that also. They can remove the aldehyde group and they make furan from their corn waste. Um, okay, how about this guy, boro? Aromatic, anti aromatic, non? How many long pairs on the boron? <coughs> no long pair. Boron is group three. No long pair. So is it aromatic? I mean, we could maybe show. We can maybe show up with a p orbital as sp2. And now it's overlapping. Now it's cyclically conjugated. How many pi electrons? Four. So if it is cyclically conjugated, 
What's the answer? Aromatic? Anti? Anti. This would be anti aromatic. Now, Barole is not easy to make and it, it doesn't really exist. There can be some fancy, you can put some substituents on it and kind of make it exist. Uh, but it's certainly not aromatic because it certainly would not have a 4n plus 2 number of electrons. So Barole is not aromatic. Questions about these? Is it anti or, is it anti or not? I'm not sure, but it's certainly not. <laughs> All depends on if it's actually uh, Actually, planar. I mean, you have to look it up and see. I'm thinking it's probably non-aromatic. All depends. You have to look and see if somebody's ever made it and it's been isolated and what type of properties have been documented for it. Um, I mean, us memorizing what what it is is not it's not the sort of the main point. The main point is just understanding the structure and, uh, and first off, it's certainly not aromatic, right? It's not always hard and easy to know if a compound is anti or not because we can't tell if it's avoiding that or not. Uh, we know questions to ask maybe. Uh, in one of these handouts there's a big list of, first off there's some warm-ups here. Uh, for example, like dication. Other questions below. Um, I think I'll move into the workbook. In, in, in the workbook, there's a page with lots of compounds and it says tell if they're aromatic or not, anti aromatic. Yeah, I used, I used to be a handout, but uh, lots of them there. Okay, we need to look at, I think, same warm up. We need to look at nomenclature. on the ring. First off, we call that dichlorobenzene. <coughs> what if there's three? Wow. Okay. Now we need to put numbers because one chlorine could be here and the other could be there, there, or there. So we have potential for isomers now. This would be called 1,2-dichlorobenzene, that one and that two. Or you can say that's one and that two, it doesn't matter. 1,2-dichlorobenzene. Now we also have some terminology here which denotes relationships between two groups. When the groups are adjacent, it's called ortho. That is, if you have one group here and another one there, the relationship is ortho. We also call that the ortho position compared to where this group is. We'll use this terminology. Um, so another name for this could be ortho dichlorobenzene. These things are often abbreviated with just maybe O. And so you might see O dichlorobenzene or ortho. We'll see more examples. The ortho matter and pair are very common. What you won't see in a textbook for some reason is the carbon that a group is on is called ipsocarbon. That terminology is used in the NMR uh, calculation sheet. That's the, that's the carbon that the group is on. So if there were two chlorines, would it actually would it just be ipso, or is it only if one is there? Well, you can't have two there. 
not not to be a double bond. But I'm glad you asked the question because now you know. You already knew, but now you really know. Um, okay. Let's do some more. So your halogens are just named like bromobenzene. Okay, there's nothing unique there. When you have a nitro group, it's also just called nitro. And we'll see more nitro. In fact, today in lab and Friday, what are you doing to fluorine? If you're nitrating it, you're going to put a nitro group on. You know, two, you need to know the Lewis structure for this group. Uh, we have a bromo and a nitro. This compound is called 1-bromo-4-nitro-benzene. You just put these, these substituent names in alphabetical order. B comes from N. <coughs> one is one, the other is four. Of course, substituents always get lowest numbers, right? You would never call this one, two, because if you can make a substituent one, you want to call it one. Well, which is one? That one or this one? That's one, this is four. If that's one, this is four. How do, you, how do you decide if you got one four both ways? Alphabetical. Just do it alphabetical. That's why the bromine is one. Because it's just alphabetical. That makes this four. One bromo, four nitrobenzene. Importantly, is this a very clear name? I mean, if you saw this name, would you know that this is this compound? It's a very clear, non-ambiguous name. Okay, let's name the one below. Don't look at the writing yet. Uh, what do we have here? Bromo, iodo, and nitro. You can all put those in alphabetical order. What's the number? Where's the one position? It's either here, here, or here, yeah? If it's nitro, where's two? Two, and then this is? Okay, why not say this is one? <coughs> if that was one, what would uh, the nitro be? Four. What would that be, five? Three. Oh, you're going to go this way, three. Well, which is better, one, three, four, or one, two, four? Lowest numbers all the way around, yeah? 124 beats a 134. Is there another way to do 124? No. So it's 124, no matter uh, alphabetical or not. But you do list them alphabetical. But the bromo is 4, right? 2 iodo, 1 nitrobenzene. How's it look? questions about that? Sean? Questions? Okay, so that's systematic. Uh, question. Which halogen is para to the nitro? Bromine. Uh, on your paper, Which carbon is ipso to iodine? Or if we're talking about iodine, which point to the ipso carbon? The one right there. The ipso carbon is the one that has the group. Now you have to identify which group you're talking about. Which carbon is the ortho carbon? Exactly, compared to what? I mean, that carbon is ortho to the nitro. But it's meta to the bromine and also meta to the iodine. Those are terminologies to help you orient yourself, just like we use northeast, west, and south. Okay? Will you um. using the terminology, you're talking about the carbon. Which carbon? No, I could say uh, which hydrogen is both ortho to the bromine and ortho to the iodine? Right there. Isn't it both ortho to the bromine? 
So it can be a variety of things. It's, it's terminology that you can use to help you describe what you want to describe. Trey. That's what I was going to ask. Like, how do you know direction? So if you just say which one's the ortho? I would have to ask you what are you, what are you referring to? Ortho to what? What if you say ortho to the iodine? I would have to right? say there's two carbons ortho. That carbon's ortho to iodine. This carbon's ortho to iodine. Right. Um, you'd have to tell me more information. And there's two carbons that are ortho to iodine. Um, the, the ortho meta pair, et cetera, is only used when you have two substituents. Once you get to three, you typically don't use that in the name because it's too much going on. It's like when you have to name alkenes. You call them cis or trans, but when you have four groups on there, you go away from cis trans, you go to something that's more clear, like E or Z. Okay. Uh, common names. Here's a list of benzenes that have common names. You need to learn all these. Thiamine is still in Walmart uh, in the paint section. Uh, methoxybenzene is known as anisole. Hydroxybenzene, we already know that, right? Phenol. Aminobenzene. Aniline. Carboxylic acid on the benzene ring, benzoic acid. Aldehyde for the benzene ring, benzaldehyde. That's acetophenone. If under my hand was a mouthful, it would be acetone. For the, for the benzene ring, it's called acetophenone. Um, if you have a common name, you want to use the common name. <coughs> Let's do some examples with common name. When you're looking at a benzene compound, you want to first see, is there a common name possible? Bromobenzene is not a common name. Sort of a very simplistic, systematic name. How about that? Is that a common name? It's benzoic acid. So it's going to be named as a benzoic acid. What's on the benzoic acid? Bromine. When you have a common name, the substituent of your common name by default is 1, <coughs> no matter what. So if that's 1, what position is the bromine at? Rebromobenzoic acid. This could also be called metabromobenzoic acid because the bromine is meta to the main <coughs> group. How about this guy here? Do you see a common name? Nitrobenzene is not a common name, but what about that? Oh, yeah. Methylbenzene is called what? Fire? <coughs> Toluene. By default, that's the one position. What's on the toluene? Three nitro groups. What numbers do you want to give them? Two, four, two, four, six, tri nitro toluene. What do you want to call that? TNT. It's dynamite. <laughs> All right. Uh, what is this? Four chloroaniline, right? That's aniline. It's got a chlorine at the four. Or you can call it parachloroaniline. What is this? Forget about the common name. It's got a bigger common name. Benzoic acid. Two hydroxy benzoic acid. Now you could say, well, doesn't it have? Isn't phenol a common name? It is. We're not going to talk about why, but the benzoic acid is sort of the king of functional groups. It takes priority. It's a benzoic acid with a 2-hydroxy. Two 2-hydroxy two benzoic acid, what do we know it as more commonly? That's salicylic acid. That's a real common name. Uh, questions about nomenclature. There's some on the back. When a benzene is a substituent, what do we call the benzene ring? Phenol. Yeah. In terms of naming. So this compound here is actually known as 2-phenylpyridine. That's 1 and that's 2. 2-phenylpyridine. Two we use the term phenol when benzene is a substituent. 
as opposed to saying two benzene pyridine <coughs> phenyl. Note that this is YL, not OL. OL means something else, right? It would be phenol. That's a benzene ring with an OH. Um, here, phenol is denoted a pH. You've seen this, okay, before. This would be called 1,2-diphenylethene. Ethene, the two phenyl groups. Now, to be more clear, what else? What do we need here? Trans, stereochemical ster descriptor. <coughs> What's a common name for that <coughs> molecule? We used it in organic one. Transstilbene, remember using it? Okay, but that's, the, that, that's kind of a super common name. If you have a benzene ring and a CH2, that's a benzyl. For example, this is benzyl chloride. Benzyl chloride. This is benzylamine. Now this is sort of this is sort of common name here. More Yalupac name would be there's one carbon, so it's methane. So you might call it chlorophenylmethane. Nobody calls it that. It's called benzyl chloride. Note this, a carbon attached to a benzene ring is known as a benzylic carbon. It's a benzylic carbon. We'll do chemistry at that carbon a little bit later. It's known as the benzylic position. We could ask questions about that using this terminology. For example, in the compound below, how many benzylic hydrogens are in the compound below? Right there, and there's two there. Benzylic hydrogen would be a hydrogen going to benzylic carbon. You might call that benzylic, well, it's probably not. Even if so, how many H's are in that carbon? None. None. I mean, there's two. Two benzylic hydrogens. So that's just terminology. Questions about nomenclature? Let's introduce reactions of aromatics. Got some warm up questions here. I think we'll look at the yellow sheet here. Ketones to the R group, that is, remove the oxygen. It becomes an R group with one more carbon. With nitro, it's a great precursor to then convert to the amino. 
And indeed, the first two reactions we're doing in the multi-week lab is the first nitrate fluorine, and then we'll reduce the nitro to the amino next week. From there, we can do chemistry with the amino groups on a benzene. We can replace the amine with lots of things. Um, there. Um, okay. Let's uh, do a look at this mechanism. So how do we get something on the benzene ring? Electrophilic aromatic substitution. Hopefully after you see this mechanism, you're going to say, this is just like alkene chemistry in organic one, but just a little bit of twist at the end. General re reaction, we have benzene, it reacts with an electrophile. Okay? The electrophile may have a positive charge or it may not. It may just be electron deficient. We're going to get the electrophile on the ring and we will generate H+. Maybe not directly, but that's the general reaction. Let's show a general mechanism. Electrophile. Neutral. Electrons like to attack it. In organic one, we saw alkenes attack electrophiles. Here, benzene has three pi bonds. Although it is conjugated and busy doing aromaticity, it will react as a nucleophile, like an alkene, in terms of initially. Now, it's not as reactive. It may take more heat to get it to react. It may take a catalyst to get it to react, but it will. So if these electrons go attack the electrophile, what do we get? We get a carbocation intermediate. Okay? Just like an alkene reacting to organic one. Here, here's, here's the pi bond. Down. There's the electrophile. Electrons go make bonds to electrophile, <coughs> leaving this carbon down here as what? Carbocation. Okay? I did a little bit of this in organic one. Okay? Carbocation. There's an H there, right? You got to know where H is there. There's an H on every carbon, right? I drew it in. Now there's two things on that carbon. Positive charge. No, destruction. That's no longer sp2. It's now sp3. This is called a sigma complex because we made a sigma bar to the electrophile. The sigma complex is not aromatic because there's no p orbital there anymore. It's sp3. But it is resonance stabilized. The carbocation is resonance stabilized. You have to be able to show that. We'll look at it below. From there, two things could happen. If this was an alkene, and maybe this was bromine, or H plus, if this was HBr, at this point, Br minus would attack cation and you would get your product. But instead, if something attacked here, you would get this product. The base or the something attacked here. The problem is this is no longer aromatic. SP3, SP3. So this is higher energy. Alternative pathway is for the, the base to take an H and these electrons move in here and put the pi bond back in. Sort of like the second step of an E1 elimination. <coughs> If it does that, we restore the aromaticity, the H is removed, the new group is there, and there's our product. This is called an addition. Here this is called a beta elimination. This is a right determining step. This is fast. If we look at their resin structures of your sigma complex, please be able to show those. Here's a reaction coordinate diagram. We react with the electrophile, transition state, leading to the sigma complex. From there, we have a transition state, the beta elimination, leading to our aromatic product. If instead the base added to the cation, we'd get a higher energy product, and the transition state leading to that would be higher. So if you're here, which path are you going to take? 
the lower energy pathway, and you get the aromatic ring. You get the beta elimination, the H is removed to restore the aromaticity. It's a very simple mechanism. At least look at it compared to alkene chemistry. We'll tie up the loose ends next time. As we move forward, we'll just look at particular examples of where the E plus is maybe a halogen. Or whether maybe it's a carbocation. It'll be the same mechanism. Just little bit differences or subtleties. Okay guys, see you this afternoon uh, in lab. Uh, the other extra credit was this Friday at 1. Okay, it's a medicinal chemistry seminar. Uh, and then if uh, we need, we'll look for makeups. Yeah, that one, I knew it was a